gathered together from the cosmic reaches of the universe, here in this great hall of justice, are the most powerful forces of good ever assembled. Dedicated to truth, justice, and peace for all mankind. Hit it. Hey, it's Joe, and welcome to another episode of Test Talks. How do you educate other members of your team about your automation efforts? And how do you talk to management about automation? We sometimes focus so much on the tooling that we lose sight of what it is we're really trying to test. In this episode, we'll be test talking with Richard Bradshaw and Mark Whittingham all about their new initiative called Automation in Testing. So in this episode, you're going to discover how to truly be successful with your testing efforts by leveraging the right tools to help with testing the right things. Richard Bradshaw is known as the friendly tester. He's also, I think, the boss boss at Ministry of Testing. He has a lot of experience in testing, consulting, and he has a true passion for testing, as you'll find out in this episode Also, Mark is a tester, coach, and teacher, an international speaker. He presents at a lot of workshops along with Richard. He also does a lot of things around API testing and integrating it with Selenium. Definitely check out his blog at softwaretestingclinic.com. So get ready to discover how to join these super friends in the hall of testing at automationintestin.com so we all get together and do good with automation. Check it out. Test Talks is sponsored by the fantastic folks at Sauce Labs, the cloud-based automated testing platform that eliminates the need to maintain your own Selenium grid and test infrastructure. Try it for free today. Visit testtalks.com and click on the Sign Up Now link under the Homepage Sponsor section. Hey guys, welcome to Test Talks. Hello. Hello, Joe. Awesome. It's great to have you on the show, Mark and Richard. Uh, You've been both part of the Automation Guild. You're a great resource for the community. And also, I think you're awesome contributors with Ministry of Tests, which is an awesome community for testers that everyone should know about. So I'm really excited to have this conversation today, basically around automation in general, but also specifically, I think you have some new initiatives going on, a new site called Automation and Testing. That looks like a lot of free courses on there, and it looks like it's going to be a really good community for people to know about, a great resource. So let's just jump right into it. Can you just tell us a little bit more what automation and testing is all about? So yeah, good question, Joe. So automation and testing is basically a new namespace created by myself and Mark, um, not to like dictate and say this is how it's done, but as a place where me and Mark can work together and produce content that we both aligned with. And also, we think it's something that the industry needs because it's not as much about the tools, AIT. It's more about the bit that goes in before it and the bit after it. So, yeah, it's a namespace me and Marco actively working on trying to improve the automation space in in testing. So, Mark, how how did you get involved with AIT? Uh, I know you guys have worked together before, but is this a a, a ministry and testing type of a group or is this a separate organization? So, separate thing. Um... This, uh, I mean, Richard and I first met uh, when we did a rapid software testing course about five years ago. Sort of a paths crossed there, and then um, we didn't really see each other again for a couple of years. Um, just very weirdly, like our careers have been quite similar in terms of the choices that we've made and like the situations that we've been in. So we actually ended up coming to what is now automation in testing. Uh, we came to the sort of conclusions uh, separately. And the first time sort of we got together and started working on this was um, when I gave my first ever talk at London Tester Gathering. And I was just sort of talking about uh, WebDriver and my observations that everyone is obsessed with WebDriver and that they talk about WebDriver all the time and all the trainings about WebDriver. And Richard came up to me afterwards and said, I'm thinking the same thing. Uh, you should come see my talk at Test Bash. Um, and that's where he first sort of mentioned automation in testing, just sort of gave it that name. And kind of from there, I sort of knew that was what, you know, what was slotting in, uh, what, what my ideas would slot into as well. Um, 
I was working on API testing quite a lot at that time. He was working on WebDriver. We felt that those two things sort of kind of connected as well. And then just through various conversations over the last few years and sharing our experiences and stuff, we've built automation and testing out from that. Awesome. So it's almost like the super friends of automation. I don't know if you had super friends growing up in the UK. <laughs> but like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very cool. They're like the Justice, Justice League of Tools. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so... Richard, I know we had a conversation about this a long time ago in our po- in a podcast episode, but for folks I don't know, I, I think this was mind blowing when I first heard it. It was like a mind shift. Automation and in, in testing is kind of a curious term for some people. Can you just explain a little what automation and testing means to you? Yeah, so I was actually looking that up earlier. It was episode forty seven, Joe, all the way back in April two thousand and fifteen. Wow, and it was titled "Can Automation Do Actual Testing?" Um, so AIT has evolved a lot since then, but I've always had this notion that I've been using tools to support my testing effort. I've never been able to replace myself with a tool. Um, there's little bits of the activities that I would do. Um, but the actual whole end to end process, I've been unable to ever fully automate. So that got me thinking about AIT. So AIT is essentially you know, a namespace where we talk about the design factors. So a lot of the theory that goes into automation, we then talk about the creation. So how do you go about creating good, maintainable automation uh, that isn't flaky for one? But then we also delve into the world of education. So how do you educate other members of your team about your automation? It could be other users, it could be other testers in your group who are going to use your automation, or it could be management. How do you talk to management about automation? Um, so those are the kind of the key aspects of it. We want to shift away from the tools as such, because if you can master the theory, then you should be able to pick up any of the tools out there and hit the ground running. So that's what AIT is. It's more of a more holistic view of the whole of automation, not just about the tools. And Mark, what were your thoughts when you first heard automation and testing? Just curious to know. I think when I when I first um, saw Richard talking about it, I, I don't think it was quite as like it wasn't as broad as that. And he was sort of talking about how sort of like he was talking about how tools support him and how he was using sort of kind of like this sort of jigsaw puzzle of different tools that work together to make automation architectures or automation frameworks, and how he would use parts of those in other aspects of his testing. And I was doing similar things, so I'm a big JavaScript nut. I love Node as well. So I'm constantly tinkering with to- uh, little toys and tools and stuff to help me with my testing in there. So I saw there was a real sort of connection between those two things there. And then, as I say, like as we then sort of started to discuss all of this and sort of try and sort of kind of put it all together into a big old mind map a few years back, we started seeing like the value of the education side. So I, lately, I've been really interested in using the Grow model for coaching, but as a means to identify problems that automation could solve. Now, nobody else is really talking about how you could use coaching techniques to support your automation. And it's through these sort of discussions that we've had that's kind of opened up all these new different avenues of research and sort of experimentation, which is really cool. So you both mentioned that it's not about the automation tools. I actually love automation tools. So what's automation and testing going to be about? Well, like, give, you, give us some examples of what kind of content then, if it's not about the tools that you, you plan on covering within automationoftesting.com? First of all, it's, it's not to say that we're sort of ragging on tools and saying it's, you know, they're useless, that they're obviously an essential part. But what we're saying is that, uh, that, sort of, that the process of implementing something should start with the analysis of problems. Like from my perspective, I'm very keen to talk a lot about modeling and learning about um, our products and our teams and how they work, and sort of asking questions and exploring and learning as much about them as possible. And then bringing that together into some sort of model that you can actually use as a way to sort of identify different types of problems. Because once you've sort of identified those problems, the actual uh, tooling side becomes a little easier. So that's why I say you still want to have a good knowledge of different tools, but knowing what the problem is makes it easier for you to just choose the right tool. And then when it comes to implementation, things just sort of become a bit more fluid. They flow a bit better because you're not fighting against the tool, trying to get it to work in a way that's not necessarily right for you. So yeah, a a lot of that sort of side of things about sort of just exploring problem spaces in teams and thinking about how automation can work there. 
Yeah, definitely. So, you know, some of the things Mark said, most definitely, I think modeling is a very important skill that a lot of people don't talk about. Um, so I think if you can master modeling, that will really help you uh, break down some of the problems you may be facing in your testing, which will in turn help you um, decide where to use automation. So we, we intend to cover that. But a big aspect of what AIT um, automation and testing.com will cover is real experience stories. So actual experience reports of where me and Mark and maybe get maybe other members of the community have solved some of their testing problems using automation, but that weren't necessarily about automated testing, automated checking. So I'm hoping to cover a lot of them as well. And then, yeah, in time, we will build up a lot of resources around programming, languages, tools, and yeah, just other day-to-day advice about utilizing automation. It's worth adding as well that although this is separate to Ministry of Testing, because we're both sort of involved in Ministry of Testing in various ways, the hope is that we can leverage something like the dojo and provide like a a blended learning experience uh, for people who come on our courses so that we can take advantage of the time together in that room to sort of talk about things like strategy. And also we try and make the course quite experiential as well. So when you're in the class, you get to choose what tools you want to implement, what problems you want to solve. But naturally, that's not going to cover everything. So the hope is, is that we will have online courses on specific tools, on specific languages that you can carry out in your own free time with this AIT mindset in mind of thinking, well, how can I use this? Not just like, as Richard said, for like regression checking, regression testing or automated checking and automated testing, but for, for example, like using it within your exploratory testing sessions and using different type tools to speed up your exploratory testing sessions. I have a question for you, Joe. Have you ever been in one of those workshops at a conference where you spend the first two to three hours installing software and having a fight with admin rights and stuff like that? A lot of the website and the dojo work will be to eliminate that as well so we can maximize the time in the classroom. Um, You know, I don't want to be fighting with people's laptops in the classroom. Let's try and do that well before the class. Let's try and teach some basics of the tools and the languages online so we can spend more time in in the class. Like Mark said, being experiential, actually running into the real problems and solving them as a group, doing what we would do in our real job. You know, we get a problem, we Google it. We We try a few things, we progress. Let's actually spend time in the class doing what it is really like to be an engine, an automation engineer or a tester in the in the industry. It's also quite interesting. The, the classes that we've run so far is the wide ranging sort of skill sets and backgrounds of the people that we've had. So we've had people who are purely managers who are just responsible for kind of managing automators um, or estets or something like that. You know, they're they're just there to sort of kind of understand. They don't. They're not responsible for implementing, but they need to sort of steer the strategy. Then we have people who are completely new to automation or believe they're completely new to automation and then don't realize that they're actually doing little bits of AIT here and there. And then we have people, you know, from the backgrounds of web-based testing to games testing to application testing. A lot of what we're talking about, again, because it's sort of focusing on the theory and the strategy, once you apply your own context you can actually get quite a lot of use out of what we're sort of going through. I've been mentioning automationandtesting.com as a resource. It's going to be a website. But but you, you've mentioned courses. So you actually do have, I believe, a course called Automation and Testing. And I think you're going to be giving it soon uh, in September at the House of Tests, I believe. Yeah, just curious to know <laughs> what overlap there is with the course and the, the, the actual site dedicated to automation and testing. Yeah, so um, obviously it, we're getting sidetracked into the course. We called the course Automation and Testing, which makes it, you know, just to make things nice and simple for us. Um, but there will be a lot of overlap. So a lot of prerequisites are done online. So to get people ready for the course, as we mentioned. Um, but we will over time hopefully start to share some more experience reports from the class online as well. So from the three-day class. But yeah, we do have a few coming up. We'll be doing it with House of Tests in September in Zurich. And we will also be doing it in Manchester in September, as well as Prague in October. So we think we've we've hit on something. People are liking it and we're, um, people are asking us to run the course, which is great. 
So, Richard, you know, you did mention a few things that may seem trivial uh, at first, but when you think about it, it really is important. And I just want to make sure people understand. A lot of times, like you said, when you go to a conference and you go to one of those workshops, it is literally half the day getting your machine up to speed. So how are you going to uh, resolve that? Are you going to have like Docker images that people are automatically have? Or are you just going to totally ignore that and just whiteboard it and have it more like a community kind of a Socratic type of method? <laughs> so let's poke Mark for a little bit. <laughs> so we, our test application is built in Docker, but like again, you have the same problem. They have to install Docker, which isn't as easy as you would hope it would be. So on a Mac, dead easy. Anyone on a Windows machine, uh, we had a lot of issues prior to the class. But the way we're going to solve it, well, the way we're going to try and solve it, I don't think you can ever solve this problem, um, but we're going to try is we got a lot of good feedback from the first time we ran this at Brighton, at Test Bash Brighton recently. So we're going to give the prerequisites as far in advance as we can, uh, which means they have a lot of time to try. But we're also going to give them a platform to be able to ask us questions prior to the class and help them solve their problems. So if they can't follow the instructions, um, they'll be able to go on Slack, on, um, on the Ministry of Testing Slack, and ask for help there. Or they can go on to the club and there's a section on the club where you can ask us for previous questions. Now, they've asked us questions to answer. And the great thing about that is over time, that will build up a collection of uh, resources and common issues that people are running into. And they'll be able to go on there to get that support. So I think that will be a useful part of it. And also, we are going to give time the night before the class. So anyone, you know, a lot of people arrive early um, to conferences and training. So we'll make ourselves available the night before. So they can come to us with their machines and we can try and get them ready um, for the class. Yeah. So as Richard said, he's offering his time up before uh, <laughs> each of the uh, workshops. I'll be putting my feet up. Um, yes, Docker was, was um, yeah, it, there was an interesting learning experience. I mean, uh, in terms of, uh, so I developed the platform at home sort of leading up to the, to the three-day workshop. And like I say, running on a Mac, it was it, it was worked quite easily because because it's a Nix based platform, so we didn't have any issues. But we yeah we had lots of issues around different flavors of Windows. So certain people on older versions of Windows, which meant you had to use Docker Toolbox versus Docker CE. Some people had um, home versions versus enterprise versions. Um, and it turns out virtualization is switched off for home versions, which kind of makes sense in a way. So we had to sort of uh, get around those sort of things. I think in the end, the Docker stuff actually turned into a bit of a red herring for the students. The intention is is that we're going to hopefully create um, a deployment pipeline, which will run all our checks for us and actually sort of get something set up. So that so we this this platform that we've built is is custom made that I started using in my web service and API testing workshops but we've then ported that across to ait so there's like it works in different ways there's lots of different opportunities for different types of checking and testing and you know it's, i kind of almost see it as like a tester's playground and i want to sort of grow it um further so people can it, it doesn't have you know it could be something that sort of sits online that people can test different tools out they don't necessarily need to have gone through ait it would just be something that's deployed online that people can yeah try different tools out and we want to sort of add different things in there like analytics uh, mobile support make it responsive uh, that sort of thing and it's a great way as well for uh, the two of us to sort of just keep up to date with new technologies and new tooling as well awesome so mark at automation guild 2018 you gave a great session called rest apis with web driver and perfect harmony and i know in your course you actually have a, a bullet telling saying what layer in your application you should write right automation for is one of the things people would get a takeaway from. So can you just talk a little bit about this concept of at a high level using REST APIs with Selenium and how that could help people test the right layer at the right time with their test? Sure. So uh, it goes back to it goes back to sort of what we keep saying, which is like problems first, tools second. When we look at what we do in terms of a automated test script or in terms of a test script that's run by a human, there's lots of different activities that are going on in there. So what we can do is we can apply task analysis, uh, which is something that sort of Richard put me on to. And we do tax, task analysis of the things that we do um, in terms of the sort of the, the life of a test. And that's where like um, 
the sacred model comes in, which um, Richard sort of put together. And using sacred, we can actually sort of break down a test, look at the different actions that we're doing. So looking at areas where we're manipulating state, uh, look at areas where we're actually using codified oracles to assert stuff. And once we've sort of split those concerns, we can then sort of start thinking about, well, what's the quickest way that I can do this? Uh, What's the nearest interface I can use to achieve my goal? So in the talk that I gave at Automation Guild, it was very, I think a good majority of it was focused on sort of getting data set up, state management. So I'm thinking about my problem. I need to create some data. Where do I need to create the data in my database? So I need to think about what's the closest interface I can use to get to uh, that database. So in the in the Automation Guild sort of talk, it was doing it on the HTTP layer because that was the easiest uh, place to just send a request to create some data. But it might be that you actually um, use like a JDBC um, and connect to the database and create the data directly in there. But just cutting out those sort of extra bits of time where you're, you're spending trying to maybe drive things through the user interface, that's what we're trying to teach um, within the sort of the workshop is, yeah, understanding what you're doing in a test, break it up into smaller chunks and make sure that your checks are basically targeted on specific areas. Cool. So Richard, I have a random question for you. Because I'm, I semi-stalk you on Twitter, I think you've been going on a, <laughs> a mini tech tour. I think you've been to Twitter, Smartbeer, Sauce Labs. I'm just curious to know, have you learned anything from speaking to these companies? I know you're always promoting the message of automation in testing. I'm curious to know, what have you gotten any feedback from these companies? Are you helping educate them or anything you've learned from your little mini tour? I'm not sure directly from the mini tours, but certainly the more I've been talking to new people recently and getting out to companies and visiting companies outside of my little tours is the the gulf in automation. Well, the gulf in testing right now is so vast. Um, You know, we get a lot of these cool talks at conferences talking about immense, amazing pipelines that we release every five seconds and so forth. Uh, And then you get, you know, people who been adding in automation for a while. But there's also a huge amount of people out there that don't have any at all, don't even know where to start, their companies aren't supporting it. And I think the more I discover that, the more I see the value in the work that me and Mark are trying to do. So I'm really hopeful that a lot of the work I intend to do with Mark going forward will make these people aware that getting started with automation is not a big it's not a huge thing. It doesn't have to be this great big approach. They can use their existing knowledge going forward. And I think that's given me it's given me a lot of framing, Joe. Um, it's given me a way of framing a lot of the knowledge that I now take for granted in a way that can be used for these people who are trying to get started. Uh, and a lot of the industry leaders and the industry tools, they push them down code. And I think we've got a long way to go before we want them to even think about writing code. There's a lot of education that needs to happen to make people more aware of the do's and don'ts, how 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 automation can be used, how it shouldn't be used, uh, and how to piece it into an existing process. I think that is often the overlooked part. How do you take your existing approach to testing and start introducing automation? when all the tool vendors and all the big consultancies are trying to take your whole process and automate it. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I'm seeing, Joe, is a bit of framing now. And I think that's really useful for me. Awesome. You know, it's a great thought that you know, for some reason, a lot of people just assume that every other company has their stuff together. Like in general, I think people think that, but I think you're right. A lot of times you go to other companies, it's the same issues you see at all the other ones. And it's not some magic bullet that automation is going to solve it all. And everyone else has their stuff together. And I think that is part of the problem, Joe, that, that you know, even then, you, like, you didn't intend to do it, but the way you said automation will solve it all, this is how the industry is selling it to yeah. people. It's, they're not selling automation. They're selling automated testing, automated checking. That's what they're trying to sell into organizations. Whereas if we stop and we actually look at their existing problems, the way they're doing testing might be perfectly fine for that context. Everything's manual. They release once a year. That might be perfect for that context. But that context could still benefit from having automation introduced to parts of the way they work. Um, it could be, you know, as some of the stuff we've mentioned, it could be creating data, it could be taking screenshots and uploading them. Either way, whatever way they're working, there's always a way that automation can support what they're up to. Uh, and I think they need 
as an industry, we need to be more appreciative of that and help them find ways that they can get value from it. I think also that that applies to whatever context of testing. I speak for Richard here a little bit, but we both, you know, we're exploratory testers. We worked on sort of, you know, quite we've been fortunate to work on sort of quite uh, mature, agile projects in the past. But some of the aspects of what we're talking about um, apply to enterprise model things as well. Um, if you are in a company that is very test case driven, it doesn't, and you have maybe like regulations in place, uh, you can still apply some of these approaches, and these mindset to things like, for example, you know, improving the speed it takes to create your data, but then still executing your test cases as a human. The fact is, is that what you're doing is you're, again, applying that task analysis, thinking about the different aspects that you do in testing and uh, finding an opportunity rather than, like Richard says, is that trying, uh, going to, having the assumption that just automating the, all of that, all of the activity that a human does is, is going to uh, deliver you value. Absolutely. And I actually was in a meeting with Richard and he, he told the CEO or I forgot the, the title of the guy, but uh, that he, he thinks they should help, help develop tools that assist testers. A lot of times people or tool vendors overlook that. And that I think that would be great if t- uh, vendors started to, to, to listen to Richard and actually start building tools that assist us and not necessarily try to replace them or 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 make some assumption as if the, the, the tool is doing something better than uh, uh, someone could do that's thinking. I guess is my point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's, to be honest, that is one of the angles that I'm really passionate about getting getting involved in more. And just to digress, but obviously I know a lot of people know me for Ministry of Testing. And one aspect I want to do with Ministry of Testing going forward is getting the community talking to the tool vendors more. You know, a lot of the time it's one way. It's the tool vendors saying we need their tool. But I think some of them could benefit from engaging with the community to find out what problems they're actually facing. And they may find new opportunities there, you know, new products that they could build. They may find, they may already have a product that they can reframe. Uh, But if they don't start having these conversations, then, you know, then they're going to miss these opportunities. And that that, those conversations will benefit the whole community and the whole industry. So a good example of that is um, I've been working on a open source project with um, Llewellyn Falco. Sorry if I've murdered your name, mate. We got together at Agile Testing Days last year and I sort of came to him with this idea of a programmable API. So taking some of that stuff that I did um, from my Automation Guild talk and actually saying, let's build an API where you can program it much like you could program something like Wiremock with uh, JSON files to create a virtualized um, API. Why not create something where we could map API calls to um, SQL statements and have it so that there's no code, it's completely codeless, and you just drop JSON files in to configure your um, SQL statements. And we call it Wirebridge. And it's, it's one of those things where I've observed people creating lots of test data, having to go into databases and inject all this stuff. It's a case of, well, like I mean, Postman's become massively popular in testing at the moment. So why not have it so that you can have an API that people can use something like Postman with to just send a request to create their data for? And that's through having conversations with the community and observing people that something like that's come about. And that's just like a small little open source project. It's called Wirebridge. I can't remember if I mentioned his name. I agree that that what you've just done there, Mark, is what would happen if we had more of the companies engaging. So because you're a member of the industry and you're a member of the community, you know, you found that opportunity. But right now, not enough people from the tool vendors, in my opinion, are active members of the community. So they could benefit from those opportunities. Okay, guys, before we go, any parting words of wisdom for folks about automation and testing that you wanted to get across in this episode? Uh, you know, I, I, the, the emphasis for me is always pushing. I know it, it, this, we need to get the right wording for it, but Making people appreciate that automation is far more than checking and testing, Mm -hmm. and it's far more than coding. So the skills needed to succeed are far more than coding. Um, So those are the two messages I hope people come across, or people it comes across to people. Someone someone who has uh, amazing skills with coding can be equally as effective as someone who has uh, very good people skills who can convince someone else to do the work for them. Um, it's just as long as you know what you need to create in the first place, uh, but you can, you know, kind of tackle it in different ways. And the idea behind the theory is, you know, you know, if you if you understand the theory and you can do all the work prior to the writing of code, 
there's always someone better than the automation engineers and the sedets in a company to write code, and they're called developers, right? So if you can do all that work up front, you can just hand it to someone else to, to actually implement, which is funny enough, that's exactly how software works, right? <laughs> Thank you, Richard and Mark, for your automation and testing awesomeness. For links to everything of value we covered in this episode, head on over to testtalks.com forward slash 213. And while you're there, make sure to click on the sign up for a free trial link under the exclusive sponsor section to learn all about Sauce Labs' awesome products and services. So that's it for this episode of Test Talks. I'm Joe, and my mission is to help you succeed by creating automation awesomeness. As always, test everything and keep the good. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Test Talks podcast. Head on over to www.testtalks.com for full show notes, amazing blog articles, and other automation awesomeness. Ah, what did I say? House of Rock. House of Rock. (laughs) (laughs) Although although I, I think they would be all right with that. <laughs>